Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm here to share an incredible work with you. Just a quick reminder before we get started. All sources and images will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find the link in the episode description as well as on our Instagram at accessible.art.history. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. For this week's episode, we are going to move north to the British Isles. On the island of Lindisfarne, off the coast of Northumbria in northern England, a beautiful codex was created by monks. It is a collection of the four Gospels and named after its place of origin. This piece dates from around 715 to 720 CE and is classified as a Hiberno-Saxon or insular art. Today, the Lindisfarne Gospels are preserved in the British Museum. A codex is an early form of a book. It was developed with the advent of the printing press. Essentially, they were sheets of parchment or vellum, calfskin, that were bound together. In all honesty, the Lindisfarne Gospel looks very similar to a book, just wasn't quite there yet. It was written in Latin, the language of the church, but in the 10th century, a monk translated it into Old English in between the lines. Besides the beautiful calligraphy, the pages are decorated with geometric shapes, flora and fauna, and portraits. At one point, it also had a beautiful jeweled cover, but it was stolen in a Viking raid. Thankfully, it was replaced by a replica in 1852. As mentioned before, the Lindisfarne Gospel was created at a monastery, but we actually know who it was made by. His name was Edfrith, and he was the abbot and later bishop of Lindisfarne. The reason that we know he was a codex's creator is from an inscription added in the 10th century by the same monk that translated it into Old English. It reads, Edfrith, Bishop of the Church of Lindisfarne, he, in the beginning, wrote this book for God and for St. Cuthbert, and generally for all the holy folk who are on the island. And Ethelwald, Bishop of Lindisfarne Islanders, bound and covered it without, as he well knew how to do. And Bilifrith the Anchorite, he forged the ornaments which are on the outside, and bedecked it with gold and with gems, and also with gilded silver, pure wealth. From this text, historians can see not only who created the Lindisfarne Gospel, but also why. It appears that Edfrith wanted there to be a set of gospels to commemorate the translation, or movement, of the relics of St. Cuthbert to the island. There are a total of 294 pages in the Lindisfarne Gospels. Since each one had to be written and illuminated by hand, it was clearly a labor of love and devotion. In fact, historians estimate that it took Edfrith six years to create it. Scientific analysis shows that he used less than a dozen natural elements to create over 90 unique colors. This codex is a clear testament to the power of the Gospels. The island of Lindisfarne is also known as the Holy Island, and sits about five miles off the coast of England. A monastery was first established there around 635 CE by St. Aidan. He was sent there on a mission to convert the local pagan population. The before mentioned St. Cuthbert was an abbot and bishop there, and his works were so renowned that he was made the patron saint of Northumbria. Due to its location, the island was raided multiple times during the Viking era. This led to it being abandoned. Many of its relics and treasures were taken to other cathedrals throughout northern England. Although many of them were taken by the crown during Henry VIII's dissolution, some of them, like the Lindisfarne Gospels, thankfully survived. As mentioned before, the Lindisfarne Gospels fall into the insular art or Hiberno-Saxon category. This style is a part of a larger migration art movement. During the early medieval period, many of the pagan tribes from the European mainland moved from one area to the next, leaving settlements and new ideas in their wake. Northern England was a particular hotspot. In fact, this is where we get the name insular. It means island. When these pagan peoples mixed their art with the Christian art of the British Isles, we got this unique style. The main objects that survive from this period are illuminated manuscripts, metalwork, and stone crosses. Besides the Lindisfarne Gospels, two other famous items are the Book of Kells and the Sutton Hoo Helmet. In order to understand the Lindisfarne Gospels, it's important to examine Christianity during this period. On the orders of Pope Gregory the Great, missionaries first traveled to Britain in the late 5th century. There were small pockets of Christians on the island, but they tended to congregate around the former Roman centers in the south, so the missionaries focused more on the northern part of the island, like Northumbria. Although the missionaries came from the Roman Catholic Church, over the decades, differences did develop between the two branches. 
They weren't big enough to create a schism or an entirely new religion, but they were noteworthy to historians. Firstly, the way Easter was calculated differed. It was due to the differences between the Gregorian and the Julian calendars, so holidays were always celebrated at a different time. Second, the monks' tonsures were cut in a different style. In Rome, their hair was cut into a halo shape in order to resemble a crown. No surviving images remain of the northern style, but it seems that it involved cutting the hair from ear to ear. The third difference is that penance was almost always performed in private, unlike on the mainland where it could be performed in public depending on the sin. Finally, the idea of peregrinatio developed and was implemented heavily in the north. This was a concept of leaving one's homeland for either missionary work or as a form of penance. Thanks to these missionaries, monasticism took a hold in northern England. At these monasteries, life was enclosed and self-sustaining. The goal was to lead a simple life focused on religious devotion. In addition, they served as learning centers. In an era without state-run education, these communities were the closest thing to a university that a population had. Because of this, they were the only places that codices could be made. Next, I'm going to discuss illuminated manuscripts themselves. But first, let's take a quick break. What is going on, everybody? My name is Dan Romagno, and I'm the creator and host of the Past Less Traveled podcast. The Past Less Traveled podcast explores some of the most interesting places, persons, and events that you never knew you wanted to learn about. Each episode is an information-packed journey into some of the lesser-known histories of the world. With episodes ranging from ancient Macedonia to John Adams' role in the Boston Massacre, you will surely find a topic that piques your interest. Each episode is 10 to 20 minutes long, so you can fit this podcast into any part of your day. You could find The Past Less Traveled on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any other platform you may use. You can also stay up to date with episode announcements and enjoy more history content on my Instagram, at The Past Less Traveled, all one word, and on Twitter, at The Past Less Traveled. That's P-A-S-T-L-E-S-S-T-R-A-V-E-L-D. Tune in weekly to get your fill of some of the most interesting places, persons, and events that you never knew you wanted to learn about. And remember, we are all trapped in history, and history is trapped in all of us. All right, now that we're back, let's go over illuminated manuscripts. Although it's tempting to think of these codices as illustrated, they are actually a bit different. Illumination is more about an embellishment of a text. It was a way to glorify the word of God. The term is almost always used to describe manuscripts of Western European origin, but it does sometimes apply to Islamic texts like the Quran. There are four styles of illuminations. Capitalized and decorated letters at the beginning of a sentence. Border art called marginalia. Carpet pages, an entire decorated page and portraits, typically of the holy figures. Because of the amount of detail in these works, the costs would have been astronomical. Therefore, only the rich, upper-class members of society could afford them. Thankfully, many examples survive to this day. This allows art historians to understand how artistic styles, especially the unique insular style, developed during the early medieval period. The process of creating an illuminated manuscript was quite painstaking. There are numerous unfinished ones that survive, so art historians have been able to figure it out. First, the vellum or parchment was cut down to the correct size. Then, the letters and words of the gospel, or other religious text, were written in looping calligraphy. They were written first in order to make sure the word was the focus, not the illumination. This kept them in line with the second commandment, that we discussed last week. Next, any designs would be put onto a wax tablet. This would allow for any mistakes to be easily wiped away and lessen the risk of destroying the manuscript itself. The wax tablet would be placed on top of the parchment or vellum, and a sharp instrument would be poked through. Next, a monk would play connect the dots and trace the outline of the design. It would then be filled in with color and highlighted with gold and silver detail. This was a very time-consuming process, but the result is absolutely stunning. It is a true testament to the devotion of the monks at Lindisfarne. The Lindisfarne Gospel is an invaluable manuscript that gives us a glimpse into monastic life in the early medieval period of Europe. It shows us that monks were willing to devote years of their life 
to glorifying the word of God that they wholeheartedly believed in. Make sure to tune in next week when I discuss the fascinating reliquary of St. Foy. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history for updates and keep an eye out for our next episode. They drop every Monday on your favorite podcast platform.